Please welcome David Acheria, CEO of MongoDB, and Jody Bonzel, founder and CEO at Harness. Hey, how are you? How's everyone doing? Great. Great. All right, let's get started here. And I feel like a talk show host doing this uh, in this kind of setup. <laughs> so, <laughs> also, uh, I've known Dave for a long time. Uh, when I was founder and CEO of AppDynamics, Dave was in our board. And I, I worked with him a long time. Uh, uh, you know, the, I still remember the very first time I met Dave uh, back in 2011. And I was this uh, engineer turned first time founder CEO running the, running the business. And we were like less than 10 million ARR. And business was doing very well. And I met with Dave and uh, I was telling him our business was doing very well. And he was, uh, but do you, and he asked me, why is it doing well? And I told him, like, you know, we have a good pro market, we have a good product, and we are, you know, the, because the product is good, that's why our business is doing well. And then he started talking about sales. And they, during that breakfast, he convinced me, like, you know, if you can marry uh, the right kind of a sales scaling and execution, then you, you know, you, 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 that's when your business will really, really take off. And I think the lessons I've learned from him as, I, you know, as we were building AppDynamics uh, and kind of how do you bring scaling and how do you execute at a, at a much higher scale, I've learned a lot from Dave and we'll, we'll talk about some of those, uh, those topics here today. Thank you. So uh, first thing, Dave, is uh, I know you, you started as an operator running uh, you know, a startup a company, took it public, and then you became a VC and then you became a, an operator again now, uh, you know, running MongoDB as CEO. So what's, why that journey, and you know, it's a pretty unique journey going back from a VC to, uh, to being an operator. Yeah, so um, um, obviously I was fortunate to have uh, some success um, with uh, my last company, and, um, and then actually saw a bit of scale. I ended up, uh, we were at Blade Logic, and then we got acquired by BMC, and we ended up uh, running the distributed business, which is about a $1.4 billion business. But after a while, that started losing its luster, and then I took some time off and couldn't find anything really interesting to do, and then Greylock approached me about being a partner. That ended up being a, a really fun experience. The reason I contemplated doing it because I really want to be involved in, in cutting edge technology and work with smart people. And actually, Jyoti and I met before the Greylock experience. In, in fact, we met when I was just trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And, but just meeting people like Jyoti was something I found really interesting and stimulating. And so, and I thought also when I looked at my board, previously the most valuable board members were the people who actually had been there and done it. And, uh, who could help me anticipate the next set of problems, the next set of challenges for the business. And I don't believe that there's a compression algorithm for experience. I think like, you know, you really have to go through the experience to really know intimately what are the next set of challenges that a company has to go through. And so I was in some ways trying to play that role for entrepreneurs like Jyothi who, you know, were starting out and building really interesting businesses. And what I was looking for was just working with smart people who had a really innate sense of um, a market opportunity, whether it was in the new market or a better uh, alternative to an existing uh, market. And just, you know, we're also, frankly, coachable and adaptable. You know, I've met a lot of uh, founders who feel like, you know, and obviously they're all, you know, reasonably smart, but the best ones I think are very, very adaptable and are listen well. And I think, you know, this might be the mutual admiration society, but I think one of the things Jyoti does incredibly well is listen very, very carefully. Now, he won't always take all, of, all the feedback, but he will listen very carefully. And I think that's one of the lessons learned from me is, is just knowing how to listen well and learn from people's experiences so you can kind of, you know, as, while you can't completely compress the experience algorithm, you can try and shorten it as much as possible. So as, since you have been on both sides, on the investor side and uh, as a VC and also on the, as, a, as, as running a company and raising capital, What's, what's your advice to the entrepreneurs here who are looking to raise capital? Uh, what's, what's the right way to pitch to the VCs? Well, I think the VCs really, I mean, um, it, it is really back to the fundamentals. I mean, and I may, at the risk of stating at times the blinding law of this, they're very, you know, at, 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 you know, they really care a lot about what is the market opportunity you're going after, right? You can have the great product and a great team, but the market is small or very niche, then the outcome is um, obviously a function of how big the market is. So one is, are you going after an interesting enough market? The second one is, you know, is, is, uh, is you, the team, obviously depending on how early you are, the team has a huge factor because you, you may be so early in your journey that there's nothing else to point to but the track record of the team. 
So as a VC, you're trying to say, what does this person or this team know, or what unfair advantage do they bring to the table that really gives them a leg up over everyone else? And the third thing is, what is it about the product or the business model that they're you know, co you know, basically contemplating that gives them a very defendable technology advantage? Um, and so those, you know, depending on the stage of the company, those have you know, varying factors. Obviously, a little later stage, market is much more well-known, and now it's all about like, can you really scale and execute and obviously, valuation you know, plays a factor in terms of, uh, of that discussion. But those are the kind of things you look for. And in some ways, I, you know, even though I've been a VC and operator, in some ways, as an operator, I'm just now investing my time, not my money. Um, and so and, you know, when I looked at opportunities to pursue, you know, whether to go back into an oper operational role, a lot of it was around like how big is the market opportunity, how defendable is the technology or the product or the business model. And is it a team that I really want to work with? And do they, you know, is it someone that I feel I can really take this company to its full potential? So I think it plays on both dimensions. Yeah, it's, you know, when I was starting as a first time entrepreneur in 2008, uh, I got rejected by a lot of VCs. So I've, I've learned the hard ways. Like, I, I got rejected by at least about 20 VCs before I got my first, first offer. And it's, it's really, my thesis evolved into like, it's only three things to look for, like uh, to convince someone how big the market is, like could this really be a billion dollar company if everything goes right? right. And then how, what's your, your unique advantage as a company, as, a, you know, as the team? And then some track record of execution, either as the, as the new startup or in the, in the past. And if you get those three story points right, that's what you, you would normally get people to be, uh, to be interested. Yeah. Well, Jyoti's been pretty modest, as m some of you may know. I mean, he's, he's obviously, I call him the $4 billion man because he sold AppDynamics for nearly $4 billion to Cisco. So um, the question I actually have for you is, uh, you know, now that you're starting a you know, harness, you know, what lessons have you learned and what are you careful about mistakes that you want to avoid the second time uh, around? That's, that, that's a good question. You know, it's uh, uh, doing, a, doing a, you know, starting a company the second time and running it second time, it's a bit easier on a few things that you that's fundraising is easier you know i don't have to go to pitch uh, pitch to 20 vcs to get a get an offer you know 20 vcs do come to me to uh, you know uh, invest in the company now so that's easy uh, recruiting is easier but the things uh, the things that don't change are you know customers don't care <laughs> they don't care like you know you had a successful company or not in the past do you have to still you know, uh, find the right product market fit? You have to build a good product. You have to service the customers. You have to compete in the market. None of that changes. So I think the, the lessons that I have learned from the AppDynamics experience building it is, uh, number one is that you know, don't, don't uh, uh, it's, it's it, it, kind of the cliche that it's, uh, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. You know, when I was doing the first time, I was just running as fast as possible all the time. And it's, it's, it takes a long time to build a company. So this time I'm more careful, like, you know, that you just have to keep that in mind early on, that it's, uh, you have to, to figure out the right balance. I've also learned that like, it's better to hire be leaders earlier than, than you think you need, because then you can delegate, you can trust. And, you know, in, uh, uh, at AppDynamics, I was hiring leaders only when, you know, it felt it was already late. Like, I should have hired someone in some role like six months ago, a year ago, so this time I'm, I want to be a bit more careful about that. The, another thing I've learned is just try to keep things simple. If you try to keep things simple, then it scales better. And you, know, you remember from AppDynamics, we, we had a lot of complexity in the business on licensing models and all sort of different things. And it works but at a, when you're smaller, but then it becomes too complex. So the more you keep things simple and straightforward, the better it is. So definitely some lessons I've learned that I'll bring in uh, as I try to do, you know, do, do a company again. Well, one of the things in the venture world that uh, VCs worry about is uh, if, you know, when they're back an uh, entrepreneur for the second time, obviously, to the point, you always get the benefit of the doubt, but there's one lingering doubt is that will the entrepreneur be just as hungry the second time around? And, um, and actually, the track record of second time entrepreneurs is not as good as you would think, because you would think this person's been there, done it, so you almost like, you know, have more certainty of a good outcome, and actually, the inverse is true. So how would you? Uh, I think that's a, that's a and that's a question I ask myself all the time as well because it's very easy to get complacent, and it's very easy to also get uh, let's say impatient because you've seen like say you know I've gone through a certain scale and I want to get there really fast, and that's what's uh, but you and you start taking shortcuts you start taking you know some of you you won't get some of the basics right when you're doing it the first time you don't have the luxury to take a shortcut because you you have to go through the the you know. Uh, you have to go. You have to walk every milestone of the path, 
And if you try to skip things, that could be a problem. And you know, I, I tell our team that we have to make sure we don't do that, but that's, that could be a challenge, yes. Right. But let's, let's, uh, let's switch topics to, you know, uh, to sales. You know, there's a, in this conference, that's, a, uh, that's, that's an important theme. Like, you know, as, as companies start, they start with a, a get, start getting a product market fit. How do you build a sales organization and how do you scale a sales organization? And, you know, you have a tremendous track record of, uh, of doing that. You know, I've learned personally a lot, lot from you there. So what, uh, maybe start with the basics on, like, you know, what do you look for when, when, when you have to hire a, someone in a sales leadership role? What do you look for? Yeah, so uh, before I answer that question, I would just say uh, the other thing I've seen with uh, being a VC here in the Valley is that a lot of founders almost view sales as, like, this necessary evil. Like, you know, yeah, you know you, obviously most founders are pretty technical, and they have this, especially in B2B businesses, they have this misconception that, the product will really sell itself. I can assure you, you know, whether it was 20 years ago or today, that, that is not the case. And, and the reality is that trying to sell into a large, complex organization with people who have different agendas, different you know, uh, biases, um, and frankly, uh, their own insecurities and issues, as well as just the organizational inertia, is not a trivial task, and so if you think sales is this necessary evil that you only do it, you know, and spend, you know, just, a little time on it and really focus all your time on product, you're, you know, you're, you're I think, doomed to a suboptimal outcome. Uh, with regards to your question, I think the first thing for a leader is their ability to recruit. And I, frankly, it's, I think, not just for sales, but for anyone. And I would make the statement that, you know, there was never a great leader who could not recruit because, by definition, the leader needs to be able to attract people who uh, obviously, you know, want to believe in the mission and want to believe and want to be part of the journey. And, and they also need to obviously know how to recruit for the time and place and the stage of the company. You don't want to hire someone who's looking to do you know, seven-figure deals when you're right now trying to land a bunch of pilots and get some tra early traction in accounts. The second thing I think it's really important is someone who's got a um, much more of a process or uh, orientation, like uh, um, you know, sales is a science, it's not, you know, it does obviously some artistic tendencies, but sales is science. You can break down the sales process uh, quite clearly, and someone who really understands sales is science and can break down what it means to really understand customer needs, what it means to um, really identify what their pain is, identify who the influencer is in that organization, and then how to prosecute a deal, and, and also know how to qualify a deal in terms of when will that deal happen? Will it happen this quarter, next quarter? and roughly what the size of that deal will be is incredibly important because you can't run your business if you can't forecast your business. And so sale, the sales leader needs to have a process orientation and an analytical framework by which they kind of think about the sales organization. Um, so th that that's, to me, is, um, is um, really important. They also you know, need to uh, understand that they can't just, um, what I'd call, you know, cut and paste from their last job, right? So, a lot of sales, sales leaders come and say, I did this you know, at my last company, I'm gonna do the same thing here. Well, every company has you know, differing uh, customer buying behaviors, every company has different competitive issues, every company obviously has had different product challenges, uh, different comp uh, competitive uh, dynamics, and so if they just try and cut and paste what they did in the previous company to this company, uh, that's also a recipe for disaster. Someone who can really understand, and the head of sales at the end of the day there's a lot of people who know how to take a playbook and then go execute it, but the head of sales has, actually has to write the playbook. And so if they've never done, written the playbook before, then you know, that's a real, you know, could be a real issue for them because it's very easy to take someone else's playbook and that's where they do the cut and paste, but they really need to be very thoughtful, work with the CEO and the rest of the management team to really understand the nuance of the business and really also then know like, what is the kind of profile of salespeople I need, what is the size of transactions I should expect now versus later? What is the cycle time that we should expect those deals to happen? How do I train my sales force in a way that makes them productive as quickly as possible? These are all things that are just not cookie cutter. And so uh, you know, those are things that I would encourage you to think about when you're contemplating recruiting a, a sales leader. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. You know, one thing, I've, whenever I have made mistakes in sales leaders, that's the one mistake I've done is uh, it's people who can't create a new playbook because every company is different, every market is different. Someone who has been really, really successful before in some market and they've tried to use the same formula would, would, would fail. Uh, and another thing is that the, the, the markets, even as the same company market will evolve. 
yeah. when what sales motion you need today and what you need two years from now and what you need four years from now is going to be different. Yeah. And people who can't change the sales playbook would, 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 would struggle there. Exactly. Uh, definitely. That's, that's the most important role to get right for B2B companies, you know, that's the, the right sales leaders. If you get your product right, you get your, your market is big enough. It's, you get your sales right, you get the, your, the primary basics right. So that's uh, really good advice on what to, what, what to look for. What, what do you look for as CEO as the key metrics when you are to measure, like, you know, how is your sales organization doing other than the, the top line numbers? Yeah, so one of the things that uh, I think is a very telling metric is sales productivity. And you may say, you know, and that's not just for sales, but for the entire business. Again, I'm talking about a B2B business. Because sales productivity is really a measure, to some sense, of product market fit. It's a measure of your overall go-to-market uh, business uh, or functions. Uh, and it's a measure of, of uh, frankly, of the value that customers perceive of your product. And so um, it doesn't mean that you have to sell a big product. You know, you could, you could smell, sell a product that has a low SP, but just sell a lot of it, and you could have high productivity. Or your business could be, you know, our average deal is a six, high six-figure, you know, maybe a seven-figure deal, but it's all about sales productivity. And to me, that's a metric that's, you know, really uh, uh, gives you a, a clear correlation to the health of the business. And, and it's something to track uh, over time. And so as you see the trend lines, if things are going up and to the right, that's good news because that means your organization is getting better. Uh, but if they're plateauing or they're going down, then something is wrong. And then the question is why? Is it a product market fit issue? Is it the fact that you're you know, really tactically selling and not really selling the strategic value of, of, of your products and services? Um, you know, is it the competition's underpricing you and you have no way to differentiate you know, your product uh, our services, and so it's really important because that's a very telling metric. The other thing uh, I look at is broad-based performance across the sales force. So you could have a great sales productivity metric, but if you have five salespeople and one person blew out their number and compensated for the four other people who maybe you know, missed their number, that's not a healthy sign. So you really want to see a high percentage of your salespeople hitting their numbers. Not 100%, but it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be 50% either. So it should be somewhere, I think, like the ideal mix is somewhere in the two-thirds to 70% range, where if you can point to roughly you know, six, seven out of 10 people making their number, then you feel like, OK, you know, things are going pretty well. And uh, because if, if 10 out of 10 are making the number, then maybe the targets are too low. And obviously, if three out of 10 are making the number, then you've got something else going wrong. So I think that's, a, that's another healthy metric in terms of the health of your business. So a lot of people struggle with open source uh, markets and MongoDB is a is one of the one of the great success stories in the open spo op open source space how do you get sales productivity to be high or you know how do you monetize effectively in open source space yeah so that's a it's a, actually that was one of the questions i had when i did my diligence is like how do we because as a vc i used to look at a lot of these open source businesses and the challenge was where do you uh, where do you put the paywall like if you give away too much of your product, then it's hard to monetize. But if you don't give away enough, then you have very little adoption. So it's, it's this classic tension between adoption and monetization. And so um, uh, one of the in things that um, MongoDB had that's pretty unique as an, as an open source company is a very different licensing model. And rather than the uh, traditional Apache licensing model, we have what's called the AGPL licensing model. So that's much more restrictive in terms of what customers can do with the technology, or frankly, what the cloud providers can do with your technology. So Amazon just can't take your product and offer it? Exactly, <laughs> and that's a real issue. Like, if you're, if you're building a product with an Apache license model, they can take your free version, plug it into their cloud, offer it as a service, and not have to pay you one red cent. So I, I would argue they've done a better job of monetizing MySQL than MySQL, Sun, or Oracle ever did. And so um, um, AGPL almost gives you all the benefits of open source, the mind share, the virality, the adoption, but also a way to kind of capture value intelligently. That's point number one. Point number two is really qualifying people who are kicking the tires versus the people who are really trying to solve real business problems. And frankly, that's a thing you have to do even if you're running a company like AppDynamics or Harness or, uh, or any other company. Like, you have to qualify who are really trying to solve a business problem versus like are just enamored with the technology. While you want to obviously get buy-in and get people to use technology, you really want to spend your time with people who are really try trying to solve real business problems. So it's, we have a saying, you know, if people are not buying, means that there's not enough pain. So you have to go find that pain and saying, is the pain 
deep enough because if it's not painful enough for someone to solve a problem, they're not gonna spend money doing so. So, so at, when we look at our ad adoption, we try and find out what are the problems that they're trying to solve and then, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, make sure we devote our energies there. The third thing I would say is, is um, the, in, in our business, you know, obviously developers are an important constituent. In fact, the most important constituent but developers don't always have the um, right to say yes, but they ha always have the right to say no. So they can kill your deal if they say MongoDB won't work for us. Uh, but they will not, it doesn't mean that just because they say they like MongoDB that you're gonna get a deal. So you know, also need to know how to sell high to the economic buyer, and obviously that person's gonna care a lot about the ROI that they're gonna get through this investment. So the tricky part is knowing how to sell low to get adoption and kind of usage, but also selling high to kind of really communicate the economic value of making an investment in MongoDB. Yeah, and it's anyone selling to developer markets, which we, you know, uh, I've done at AppDynamics, we do at Mongo, you have to give them something to use without talking to a salesperson. Yes. You know, it's a, if you have to implement a sales force and a sales process, and eventually that's how you will do business. But it, it's, and I, and I was a developer before, I can tell you, like, and I won't, if I, ha I can't touch the software, I can't try the software without having one or two sales meetings before, I won't use it. Exactly. So it's, 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 it's a must, and you know, it's, uh, I, I've seen companies doing very well with when it's, it's uh, not open source and do a freemium kind of model. It's at, at least easier to monetize, but you, you compromise on the adoption and the virality, it's, it's lesser on, 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 on freemium. Do you think at, at uh, at MongoDB, when you look at freemium, uh, it's, uh, are the open source strategy is really an extension of a freemium kind of model? Exactly, so, so the, um, and actually that decision was made before I got to MongoDB, but the founders realized that you know, there will never be another new commercial database because the open source alternatives are too good. So they made a decision to outsource, but they didn't make the decision to outsource because they wanted to leverage the community to make the product better. They made the decision to outsource to make it a very frictionless way to use the product. And in some ways, you know, I remember in the early days of AppDynamics, you were very focused on like making it really easy for people to download AppDynamics and get um, you know, real value quickly, which puts a high burden on the product teams because the product has to be immediately you know, very easy to use and there can't be any real bugs because if there's a bug that you know, the user, or in this case, in our case, the developer will stop using it immediately. So it puts a lot of pressure on the engineering teams to really make sure the product is rock solid before you release it. Yeah. It's kind of ironic that you know, the, the bar on a free product is much higher than the bar on a paid product. Because yeah. on a paid product, you have a sales engineer involved or someone involved. You can curate the experience. You can, yes. In a free product, it's got to work. It's got to yeah. work in five minutes, otherwise you lose them. Exactly. So it's, uh, it's, uh, in, in my experience, like, you know, I would rather wait to launch the free product and I would, until I have like, more customers who have refined, yes. refined, refined the product. Uh, no, it, it's, it's interesting what you described on the kind of like, you have to go to the developers in these markets, but you still have to go and go to the economic buyer. Yes. And I'm, uh, I've started calling this like the sandwich model, like you go from the bottom and you go from the top and yeah. you have to do both. Otherwise, yeah. like if you don't go to the bottom, you don't get the adoption, you don't get the mind share. If you don't go from the top, you don't get monetization. Uh, people don't, uh, you can't get larger deals, you can't go into larger enterprise, so it's uh, Yeah, and, and actually the irony is like, you know, in the, in the, like, you know, when I was a VC in the early part, you know, um, you know, post like the 2008 crash, a lot of people said, hey, we want to get away from these expensive sales and distribution models because we want to go with a high velocity kind of sales model that's cheaper and easier. I would argue actually the sales challenge is even greater today because you know, developers and users have so much more power today than they ever had. You know, in the old days, you could sell to the corner office, yeah. you know, take them out to some nice dinners, maybe take them to the Super Bowl, and you got your deal. Now you really got to drive, and that, that deal decision could be kind of, you know, mandated top down. Those days are long gone. You have to be able to get, you know, adoption at the user level, no matter what product you're selling. And then that then gives, then you also need to be able to sell high and, and obviously frame, frame the value proposition in economic terms. Okay. So let's, let's, let's talk about, you know, scaling an organization and, uh, you know, the, the management and leadership lessons as, you, as, you, as you've gone through it. So what, what, what are the, the most painful lessons you have learned? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> So um, I've made my fair share of hiring mistakes, um, and uh, so I would say, like anyone who thinks who hires, says, you know, thinks they can hire perfectly, you're either hiring way too slow, or you're delusional. So uh, what what would you call a good success rate? How many out um, of ten you get right, and it's a good success rate? Obviously, the penalty for a senior level hire failing is much more impactful to the business than say a mid level or a junior employee. 
but I would say, you know, if you can be kind of batting, you know, 600, 600, 700 on hiring, you know, I think you're doing quite well. Um, so, you, you know, you can't wait too long because, you, you know, you have the pressures of the business and, you know, you, want, you need to kind of hit timelines. So you've got to hire, but you also got to be very judicious about who you hire and, um, and make sure you, you, um, you know, qualify their skills, experiences as, as a fit to what you're trying to do. I would say in terms of uh, um, um, the, uh, one of the big lessons I've learned is that every person has a fit for the stage of company, right? So I've made the mistake of recruiting people with a big brand and a big background. Maybe they came from a large tech company, but they completely didn't understand what it took to be part of a small company. At BMC, I had you know, 4,000 people reporting to me, and everyone says, oh my god, that's such a big organization. The dirty little secret is I think it's actually harder to manage 40 people than it's to manage 4,000 people. Because when you manage 4,000 people, you're really managing about 8 to 12 people. And so, um, and there's obviously a lot of momentum in the business because you wouldn't have got to 4,000. You, you know. can mess it up really fast. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's you a know, big but, shift. But the it's small one, you can mess it up yeah, really fast. A couple of bad, bad hires, yeah. uh, you know, change the culture, so all of a sudden the dynamics change. And so uh, I think it's really important to make sure you're hiring. Uh, the second one I think you, uh, you alluded to is hiring leaders um, early and almost leading with leadership because um, you know, and a lot of people feel like they need to be involved in every decision, they need to micromanage every decision, but if you hire good people, um, you know, the dividends pay back you know, in, in multiples. And I would argue that uh, a leader really has to do three things well. They have to recruit well, they have to develop their people, and then they have to get their people to execute. If you do a really good job on recruiting, the other two become very easy. If you do an average job in recruiting, you can spend all your time on development, you know, making them, training them, coaching them and all that, but you'll only have a mediocre outcome. So if you can really, really hone your skills on really recruiting the best people. Um, and then the other thing I look for is like uh, passion and motiva motivation of the person, right? So sometimes I look to hire the, the number two person in a role who may not have been given the chance, whether it was a VP of finance who wants to be a CFO, Maybe a director of engineering has never been a VP because that, they never got the opportunity, but you see the hunger, the passion, and then you qualify, you know, do they have the skills, experiences to really make a difference? So, so finding those people who really have that burning passion is, to me, you know, half the battle because that, that you know, if they have the passion, they're smart, they'll figure it out, and they'll ask for help. And so um, those are the kind of things. The other lesson I've learned is um, bad news travels very slowly up the organization, but very quickly down the organization. And for people who are maybe now, you know, soon, you know got, maybe you, were, you, know, you, you didn't have a managed large team before, but now you started a company, you may have 20, 30 people in your team, you, know, you will underestimate this point until you live through it. And what I mean by that is like, imagine when you have to tell your boss bad news. You typically will couch and say, hey, Jyothi, you know, this is a little customer problem, you know, and we're trying to figure out, but you know, it's everything, we're, we're taking care of it. And you're like, okay, that's great. Meanwhile, you're saying, oh my God, it's a freaking disaster. You know? and, so, um, uh, and so a leader can get very easily inoculated from the real what's happening in the business because information is always managed up. And so I have a rule. Whenever I see something bad, I automatically assume two things. One, it's far worse than what people are telling me. And two, I'm just seeing the tip of the, uh, tip of the iceberg that there's a much deeper problem. And so obviously I can't be involved in every meeting and every issue or every discussion but I try and kind of do a lot of sampling of what's going on in the business. Whenever I see something bad going on, then I'll start peeling back the onion and really digging deep, and invariably the issue is much worse than what was being presented to me. And so that's, I think, a very important lesson. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say, like, you know, the, for me, the, 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 the scariest part when, you know, AppDynamics was growing was the, very, the first day when, you know, I was in an elevator, and there was this guy, and we were like maybe 70, 80 employees, and we just had a new hire, and he was too scared to talk to me. And I was like, wow, this is, this." it was, it was kind of a scary moment for me because when we were small, it's like everyone would tell, tell me everything. People would be, hey, dude, this is wrong. Like no one would be, people won't be hesitant in talking about, about, about things. But as the organization grows, it's a big challenge. Like, you know, it's just, you don't know what's going on. Exactly. And I, I like to say, like, we can fix, we can fix anything. The only thing we can't fix is things that we don't know. Exactly. And that's, it's, it's, it's very hard, uh, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, Right. It's, it becomes harder and harder as right. you go. So the cultural implication for the business is, uh, you know, you got to get people to share bad news early. And the point you have to say is, if you share bad news early, then we can actually do something about it. If you share it at the, you know, at the eleventh hour, then there's pretty much nothing you can do. A customer is going to churn on you, or you're going to have a 
big product delay that you didn't plan for, or and maybe you're thinking of using that you know customer win or that product release to drive your next round of financing. So that can really have you know huge implications uh, downstream. Great. So uh, one last question. I know we are getting on top of our time here. Uh, you have the unique adv uh, advantage of taking two companies or the unique honor of taking two companies public. So what's uh, uh, what, what do you think about like you know? When people talk about like should we go public or not, and you know it's like for a lot of companies these days uh, there's a lot of private capital, so people are debating is IPO the right path or remaining uh, private is, is is better. What what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so I've actually been involved in five IPOs. So one as an employee, one as a Section 16 officer, two as CEO, one and uh, 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 one as a board member. I think that's five. And uh, um, and so and some of them did not go well. So <laughs> and so I would say. Um, if you, if you want to take your company public, you have to make sure your company's ready on three dimensions. One, operationally. You know, can you do what you say and say what you do consistently? Uh, second is fiscally. Do you have the financial profile the cust that public investors would consider you uh, an attractive investment? And you know, I think it's been said in this conference, you've got to have a certain level of scale, a certain level of growth, and so forth. And then the third one, I would say, is culturally. Are you prepared to be a, be a public company? And what that really means is you have to really balance short term with long term. And you know, public investors tend to be very quarterly driven, but there's some investors who also are betting for the long term. In fact, they're probably paying a price because they're expecting an outcome you know, on, a, on a expectations of the next, say, four to six quarters. But you have to be able to balance short term with long term. You can't be so short term focused that you're just managing quarter by quarter because you'll hit a wall, but you can't just ignore the quarter and say, like, you know, I'm just focused on like, you know, what's going to happen at the end of 18 or in, tw in 2019. So that's the issue that you have to uh, really think through. And not every company needs to go public. Um, you know, and uh, obviously companies today are now waiting longer to go public. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, it is not like the natural outcome for all companies. It's, it's very reasonable and rational uh, to get bought. And obviously that was a decision that App Dynamics went through. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, it was actually contemplating going public for a couple of years. Yep. And at 11th hour, someone swooped in, and you know, with the benefit of hindsight, that was the best decision for not only the investors and the employees, but everyone. Yep. And so, um, um, but not every company needs to go public. But I th and so if you do go public, the third thing I would say is you need to be uh, acting like a public company almost like a 12 to 24 months before you go public in terms of how you close your books, how you manage your numbers, how you hold yourselves and your team accountable to hitting those numbers, because what you don't want to do is go public and then have a shock to the system, say, oh my God, I never realized I had to deal with all these issues. And that's where people kind of hit a wall. And so uh, that's, I think, really important. And so, and it's good training because, um, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when you're a founder and, you know, you're just bootstrapping the company, it's just you, yourself, and your team, you talk, but then you get an investor and all of a sudden the investor wants board meetings, like, oh my God, this is a pain. But that's just an act of growing up. For a board meeting forces you to assess the business on a, monthly or quarterly basis, what's going well, what's not going well, where do we need to focus, blah, blah, blah. And you know, going public is like another form of you know, maturity. Now we have public investors we have to, to uh, you know, worry about and, uh, and uh, make sure that um, you know, we understand what their concerns are and also take stock of where the business is. And the one slight nuance is public investors also tend to care about metrics that you may not actually manage the business by. One example of that will be billings. Uh, billings is, is a met financial metric that probably, you know, you don't really worry about today as a private company. But that's the reason public investors care about that is because bookings is not a gap metric. So billings is their way of trying to get a sense of, you know, how the business is doing. Because revenue for most subscription re uh, software businesses is a lagging indicator, not a leading indicator. So the only way they can get a sense of how healthy is the business is by looking at billings. But that, you know, there's implications, like does the if the customer pays you up front, that helps billings. If they pay you over time, that doesn't. So these are all things that nuances that all of a sudden you have to really have your arms around because the street is going to have some expectations. And there have been a couple of IPOs that went public last year, MuleSoft and Cloudera, who did fine on the revenue not line, but then missed their billings number and the stock dropped by like 30%. So these are things that you do need to worry about uh, as part of a public company. So uh, we are at the top of our hour. I want to thank you, uh, thank you uh, for uh, for a great conversation thank here. You. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank Give you. a big hand to thank Dave you. here.